All right, welcome to Stereo Psych. Um, this is actually technically take two. Um, I'm Stephen Downey, a clinical psychologist from Australia. I do breakdowns on, breakdowns on the Am I the Asshole Reddit thread. Um, and yeah, today we'll be uh, doing a Reddit breakdown like we normally do. I'm sort of running through a Reddit psychologist series where I'm just sort of doing Am I the Asshole, um, okay, Am I the Asshole uh, Reddit threads and sort of breaking down how would a psychologist think about them. Um, feel free to submit things in the comments for me to review. Um, feel free to complain in the comments if this is starting to get repetitive. Um, I'm, I'm becoming aware that there are very uh, common themes of our the asphalt threads, so we may need to branch out over time. Um, like if you like it, subscribe if you want to see more like this. Um, and without further ado, we'll get into this. Now, slight update on this one. The first one here is actually either an update or they remove the original thread or, or post and put a update over it. But um, my, my first take was reading that through from beginning to end and being like, this is an update. So um, in this one, we'll be moving to the second one, uh, which I think is actually an interesting question. So am I the asshole for refusing to, sorry, am I the asshole for refusing to apologize for not telling my ex-son-in-law about our family's history of mental illness? Um, I think a lot of people have this question. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm down for it. And the uh, account name is, Throw away nom no my anal. So clearly this person does not want to be found. Um, that's not what I intended to click. All right. There we go. I'm on it. I swear I'm I'm engaged mentally today. All right. My my so I am a 60-year-old female. My son-in-law, oh ex-son-in-law, was 43, and my daughter is 43. Uh, they had a very ugly divorce that resulted in their kids, 18-year-old male, 15-year-old female, 10-year-old male, no longer speaking to their dad. And my ex-sister-in-law's, ex-son-in-law's side of the family, no longer speaking to us, fair call, and refusing to attend any holiday or birthday event for the grandkids if we're involved in any way. Okay, tell me more. My son-in-law spent time in jail for screaming at the judge, handling the divorce case, calling him a piece of human trash and an enabler of deception and bragging about writing rants about the judge online. My daughter was diagnosed with schizophrenia a few years into her marriage. Now my ex demands that my husband and I apologize and pay him damages because he claims we should have told him before the wedding 22 and a half years ago that our family has a history of mental illness. At the time of their wedding, my daughter did not show symptoms. My mum, who was already deceased at the time, had schizophrenia. A few relatives in the generation before her also may have had it, but they were in a time when it was hushed up. My husband and I did not have any mental health issues. My daughter gets married, and a few years into it, she so shows symptoms and gets diagnosed with schizophrenia. Her ex knew this and continued to be married to her, signing up for fatherhood with her. My daughter found it hard to keep employment and was stifled in her marriage. She filed for divorce and only then did her mental health become an issue with her ex. He posts rants that he wants an annulment because he was lied to and he wouldn't have married her if he knew she was going to be insane. A lawyer friend told him he did know for years about the family history after my daughter got diagnosed and didn't ask for an annulment for nearly two decades and California rarely grants them. Very few lawyers do them. The judge implied my ex's ex-son-in-law's vocational experts and himself were untruthful about my daughter's employment prospects and ruled for alimony that had the potential to be re renewed indefinitely since this is a long-term marriage by uh, California standards. My son-in-law is furious at having to pay that and that it's insulting that he has to be given a legally mandated amount to send his children. He claims there was never a marriage to begin with. He now says we're the real villains because we knew and should have made sure he knew and not just assumed that he knew that our daughter could become mentally ill. I'm going to read that again just because I haven't quite got that. Now, he says that we are the real villains because we knew and should have made sure he knew and not just assumed he knew that our daughter could become mentally ill. He said as compensation, we need to pay for his lawyers and support our daughter. So his alimony is zero because the judge hates him now because of my lie and will extend, likely extend her alimony forever as they are past 10 years marriage in California. I told him I'm not apologizing for revealing privileged medical information that wasn't mine to reveal. Am I the asshole? There's a lot in this. I'm just checking the time because I've got a client in about 40 minutes. So uh, we should be good here. <sighs> There's a lot in this. So where would I start with something like this? When somebody brings you a case like this, which frankly, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a human. This is a juicy case. 
lots of details. My mind immediately runs off to all this stuff of, oh, I want to know this. And what about this? None of that is important, right? So the first thing I need to do is who is in front of me, right? So first off, I'm probably going to do this in two parts because I think there's two important parts of this. The person in front of me is the mum, right? The mum of the daughter who herself has no mental health issues that she reports to us. And uh, she is sort of asking for some clarification around, essentially, am I wrong for not having disclosed this information to my son-in-law 20 odd years ago, right? So that's that's our starting point, right? Though I do want to at least make some general statements about this situation, because I think there's some cool concepts in here, right? So um, at this point, I, I guess, We'll deal with the mum part first simply because it's simple, right? So um, again, I'm throwing the, the thinking style. This is not specific to this person. I would hate for them to go and take it and then use this specific thing, right? That's not the point of these videos. They are for educational purposes, right? I want to show you the thinking style because there's a lot of people get into this stuff and they'll start making comments about the children, about ages of children, about how could he do this in a in the judge and sort of what is this alimony situation and blah, 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 right? They, they get distracted. Whereas as a psychologist, it's important for us to stay focused on the person in front of us who is clearly the stressed out individual who's like, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. Did I, did I do something wrong? So let's actually deal with that question first. And I, normally I do some other stuff. Is she the asshole for not telling her son-in-law about that? Um, right. No. And there's a fair few reasons for that. So let's start with, this is a six-year-old woman, and we need to understand that contextually, uh, mental health has become more prevalent over her lifetime as something that could be talked about openly. But schizophrenia is even today still fairly taboo, right? It's it's not something which you share as a general rule. People who say, I'm struggling with my mental health, this, that, the other. Rarely, if somebody has schizophrenia, do they actually name it? Uh, there's still a huge amount of stigma around it. All right? Now, just because there is schizophrenia in your family history does not mean that you will get schizophrenia. All right? So generally speaking, for most uh, mental health conditions, you need to have some kind of a genetic uh, susceptibility to it, right? which usually by itself is not enough. It can be, usually not enough. You then need environmental factors which trigger that underlying vulnerability, and then you have it. And so this is one reason why, um, you probably didn't think I'd be talking about weed today, um, anytime I have a client who comes in and they tell me that they smoke weed, the first thing I do is check, do you have a family history of schizophrenia? All right? If they don't have a family history of schizophrenia, I don't care. There are worse things to do than smoking weed, right? Frankly, as a psychologist and the damage that I directly get to witness, I would take weed over alcohol any day of the week, fight me. But back to this, weed can be one of those switches that once it switches on schizophrenia, we can't switch it off. So with a situation that uh, that somebody comes in and they're sort of disclosing family history, what would I say to somebody like this? Well, the first thing is, please don't do weed. And that would expand to anybody that is blood related to the uh, mother. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't have it here. Sometimes I've noticed when I'm watching this back that I can't find the stuff that I know in my head and I just cannot see it. I saw one yesterday and it's just sitting there and it irked the crap out of me. But that's what happens. When you're live in a situation, you miss stuff. I believe she said it was her mother or her grandmother who had schizophrenia. So essentially anybody, my mum had schizophrenia. Right, I have found it. Anybody bloodline down from that mother should not do weed, right? Can I like a switch? Um, am I saying the daughter did we? No, I'm just saying that schizophrenia often requires a trigger. Now, what could be a different trigger for schizophrenia? Stress. Hurrah. Um, good luck. Her daughter is, I think, the top end of a millennial. Uh, so um, good luck with avoiding stress in your life. But that's a topic for a different day. Um, so situation like this, we've got a genetic predisposition. I don't know very many people that are pre-marriage having conversations about potential uh, for um, potential for transmissible diseases in a future relationship, right? So, I mean, these days, I see a huge amount of people, they're not even doing premarital counselling of any kind. There isn't a space for this discussion. 
Um, but I don't think that it's necessarily incumbent on parents to be, uh, as somebody's like, hey, can I have your daughter's hand in marriage? And it's like, well, let's run through the document first. That just isn't how that conversation goes as a general rule. The expectation is you've, you've had this conversation. And it could be that the daughter didn't know that grandma had schizophrenia and that mum didn't think that it was relevant. You know, like a lot of people think that schizophrenia is not genetic, in which case, uh, and by that I mean just colloquially, not the research doesn't bear that at all. Um, but you wouldn't know that mental health is transmissible. Very often people put it down to life circumstances, trauma, blah, blah, blah. And so um, if somebody uh, does not have that knowledge, they might not even be aware that they need to talk about it. You know, um, people tend to be a little better on things like uh, a little better. That's a rough way to put it, but I stand by it. Um, transmissible things such as like obviously Down syndrome, um, sometimes things like Tay-Sachs disease. And so we have things, uh, things, good Lord, I'm on fire today. We have uh, people called, I believe they're genetic counselors who will do genetic screenings on both sides to sort of tell you about the likelihoods of various conditions and stuff like that, where your child has a higher or lower likelihood of passing through like blood conditions, um, you know, uh, various genetic defects, abnormalities, things like that. You know, they are, to my knowledge, very rarely used. Um, but yeah, could could that have been the case in something like this? Well, frankly, I don't actually know if schizophrenia shows up like that on that kind of a test. So, you know, I'm not really sure what the options are. And is, you know, I'm just I'm just not sure it's reasonable, right? So I'm treating this request as if it's reasonable because it's being asked by the mother, not on the basis of what the son said. And that's something which is which you've got to be cautious about as well i'm not buying into his idea that he should have been given all this stuff we're looking for from a reasonable view what could this mother sort of expect and be potentially held accountable for in her own actions and it's like well given her age i wouldn't expect it given the general public's knowledge about mental health you know i wouldn't expect it um and given that the daughter showed no symptoms at the time of the wedding i wouldn't expect that you know, so let's deal with a few things here, which are important about generic stuff. First up, one of the things that most people would not know is important, but that 22.5 years is incredibly important. It's also important that it's that many years, right? Why? Generally speaking, schizophrenia has what we call a prodromal phase. A prodromal phase of schizophrenia usually starts from, please don't kill me here, I don't remember if it's 16 or 19, I think it's 19, and runs through to about 23 years, right? In that time, somebody who is uh, who is becoming a schizophrenia, right, so showing the early signs of psychosis, we call it prodromal, um, they really just act slightly oddly and disorganised, like scatterbrain, nothing that you would not expect from somebody who is just a bit of a scatterbrained individual, you know, um, as much as you can look back and see these things, generally speaking, right? So these guys got married. If I'm reading the ages right, so she's 43 female at the moment. They, uh, the wedding was 22 and a half years ago, right? This daughter would have been 20 and a half years old. She's not even halfway through the period that we would expect schizophrenia to begin to express itself, right? Um, schizophrenia does appear earlier than that. I've seen it once in my career, um it's it's extraordinarily rare like childhood schizophrenia extraordinarily rare uh, generally speaking it's older than that. um so uh for this one here i'd be looking at that age and going yeah she's she's actually banging that age that she is even if she's getting schizophrenia we may not know um realistically uh they it should show up somewhere by the time she's 23 generally speaking again these are averages so you guys probably don't do statistics, but we do everything on a bell curve. Generally speaking, 23 is just going to be the average age by which it's it's shown up. But some people are going to be very much earlier, such as the ones that have like, you know, let's say childhood uh, schizophrenia. Some people will be very much later. Um, later is, is as unusual as earlier, right? Uh, generally speaking, if somebody has schizophrenia later in life, it's usually drug induced. Um, and they don't sort of have what I would consider to be true schizophrenia but rather that they more easily disconnect from reality under the influence of substances. Um, I, I've i not seen everybody. I'm not going to say, that, oh, Steve's personal experience, so you should drop me on this. I'm just saying I personally have never seen a case where psychosis, uh, in some kind of a natural sense, nothing to do with substances, has occurred later in life spontaneously. Um, I've never seen that. Uh, mania, which is different from psychosis, yes, uh, 
Um, but again, the warning signs are are there from earlier on. So, you know, um, we can go into mania. I'm surprised we haven't hit bipolar yet in uh, in Reddit. I'm keen for that one. I love it. I, I love it. It's something that I've, I've had to learn a lot about because it's more common than I thought it was. So, uh, but anyway, so uh, one of the starting points that yeah, I'm, I'm drawn to is actually the age difference here. Not only could the son-in-law not have known, the daughter not have known. Uh, she's really not even halfway through the period that we would expect it to begin expressing itself. Um, so, yeah, then we've got the uh, going for an, an annulment after two decades. And, you know, geez, people can be mean, utterly ruthless. Um, but when he goes in here, so I'm just getting a wire out of the way of the screen, and he says um, that he didn't really have a marriage. And it's like, that is brutal you know like there's there's cruel and then there's like what the heck um you know from mum's perspective only then did her mental health become an issue with her ex i doubt that by the way I, I believe that is a mother's view of her child and an external view to the relationship it is difficult for me to see how schizophrenia uh would not play a fairly heavy role in the relationship over time that's fine um, you know, we, we allow people to be charitable towards their own daughters against people that have treated them like trash. I don't expect the mother to be uh, to be unbiased in this situation. Um, yeah, he claims there's never a marriage to begin with. You know, they're just this is something that I actually see frequently. And uh, I get it when when trust breaks down. But sometimes people sort of ask me, why? Why does this happen? Or how can this happen? Right. And uh, that, I think, is something that's worth burrowing into. Generally speaking, if a relationship ends, what we actually need as, as a human, so let's say I separate from my wife. I'm going through a grief process, and I need to be able to essentially do things to my wife that if empathy were thoroughly intact, I would not be able to do, right? But the issue with this specific grief process in terms of a separation is nothing about it is what grief the emotion was designed for. Grief the emotion is designed for loss where the thing is gone, never to return, right? That's how the emotion is meant to work. And the idea is that it helps you sort of work through it. And then when you're done, you're done. Um, but in, in the case of a split relationship, that's not actually how that works. And so the reminders are there. The person is still alive. The brain gets these repeated signals of, but this thing should still be going on, Um so it makes the grief process very, very difficult, actually, to get properly started and going because of this constant, I guess, uh, uh, the, the brain constantly saying, but this could not be the case. So what I find is people harness essentially hatred to push the grief process along, right? which just means empathy has to be killed. And when empathy is killed, you see people do some very strange things, you know, um like this so i look at the situation and i go yep this is this is one of those ugly ones like nothing here is going to work well um but you know uh, the whole situation is a bit um <laughs> difficult to begin with so let's switch sideways into the son-in-law himself because i think that's it's worth looking at somebody like this um there's too much here that we don't know right is this man just driven to distraction or not we don't know um, going into the divorce case, calling the judge a piece of human trash, an able of deception. That's those are not words you want to say to a judge, you know. Um, bragging about writing direct rants about the judge online, you know. When you go to court and you need somebody's favor in terms of like, you know, um, yes, the situation is going to be decided by a jury or whatever in some cases otherwise it's just the judge themselves why would you intentionally antagonize the person who even if they're against you you still need the most favorable result right and i do see this behavior out of almost exclusively men who seem to do this chest beating rant and it's like why what do you not understand about the fact that even if the judge hates your guts you shouldn't make it worse for yourself, you know? And I look at that and I go, that's that's rubbish, you know? So ideally don't do that. Um, posting rants that you want an annulment and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not particularly out there. Um, you know, and then just, I guess the... 
misrepresenting each other in court. I do find it funny that some people just have no respect for court and uh, they just use it as if it's a tool to be used to their own advantage. And um, I think, yeah, you end up in situations like this. So um, what, what I did want to say is he says we're the real villains because we knew and should have made sure he knew, right? I I have never seen any parent do some kind of informed consent process with their prospective, you know, child spouse um, in this kind of a way. Like the expectation is that, you know, conversations that are available to happen have happened. And uh, this is wild to me. Do, do I think that it's wrong? The whole point of marriage, isn't it, is for better or worse? Like, you know, these people are married. And so the expectation is that he signed up and a sort of in, in sickness and in health and he got the in sickness part here and then he decides that actually he didn't sign up for that you know um that's that's not what it's like and then goes for an annulment i'm, I'm curious about that i'm assuming there must be a legal context to annulment that it means that he's no longer responsible you know for the children or something like that um something that's rough in this situation in terms of very ugly divorce that resulted in the kids no longer speaking to their dad um you know, uh, I guess for the sake of the son-in-law, I'm kind of glad that his family sided with him because at least he's got some support. Um, but you do wonder what goes on in a situation like this that means that the children no longer speak to him. And this is where I get suspicious. A 10-year-old, generally speaking, um, would be a little young to decide not to speak to his father. All right. So this is an impossible, by the way. And I've seen situations involving domestic violence, for instance, where absolutely that's the case. Um, and I've supported those decisions. But that isn't mentioned anywhere in here. And so it's something that just draws my attention to go interesting. Um, why has this turned into a very one sided rather than going for, OK, we're getting divorced. Let's just make the best of it. Um, you know, has this really just turned into an absolute mud slinging match, which has involved, you know, I guess, uh, feeding opinions and information to children, just because a 10 year old making that decision is by no means unheard of. But I personally have only really seen it in cases involving things like domestic violence. Um, yeah, so again, there's, there's things that I don't know. What else do I not know about this situation? Um, <laughs> You know, we're given very little information on the marriage itself. For me, that would change just at least my view of some of the things here if I had more information about the marriage itself, but I don't. And that's that's fine. Remembering we're dealing with the mother, not the uh, the, the daughter or the son-in-law, you know, um, but that, that would change some of how I view this. Um, in terms of what we know about the mother, uh, this relationship has gone wildly south. Um, I'm kind of expecting that uh, that there's a lot more to the history between this mother and the son-in-law than what we're being told here. The way that he sort of escalates to, we are the real villains because we knew and should have made sure, or should have made sure. And, um, you know, uh, just, yeah, I, I guess I'm looking at it and going, it seems like, where we're not getting the full picture, which which we won't, you know, when you're given information from a biased party, you need to assume you're, you're not getting the full full picture. Whatever here, what what is the pathway forward from here? You know, um, in a situation like this, as much as it absolutely sucks, I I would look at this situation and kind of go, well, hang on, like, are we working towards there being a relationship here? You know, uh, or, or is this it? Uh, because 10 year old, you, you're you going to have to interact with this person for at least the next six to eight years. Like, is this how you want it to be over that period? Because that's pretty rough. Um, you know, so uh, I, I'm, I'm left curious about that. Um, I, I would want to see that we've got at least some pathway forward in mind to make it as amicable as it can be. Um, for that to happen, we're going to need to get final judgment so that it's simply done and he needs to have exhausted his options. And uh, I think I'd be having chats around once he's exhausted his options, 
we think about is is there an olive branch that we can at least have some form of co-parenting um, just because generally speaking, if there isn't domestic violence or anything like that, he has every right to be able to see at least his 10 and 15 year old child, um, you know, uh, trying to go through custody situations where, oh, sorry, trying to fight custody battles and, and not allow access to that would require extenuating circumstances that I'm not seeing in front of me here. Um, and, and I say that from the perspective of this, uh, the 60 year old mum is biased against the son if there was a history of domestic violence here, I'm confident it would have been disclosed. Um, so I'm, I'm left assuming that it's not, in which case, yeah, I'd be looking forward to a period of time where, you know, co-parenting is likely to be going on and you kind of want that to be better rather than worse. Um, you know, so that, that would just be uh, some of my thoughts there. Um, all right. Well, we uh, I think we've covered most of that. Um, if I've missed anything, then by all means, chuck it in the comments. But yeah, there's there's a lot going on there. Um, I think this is this is one of the hard parts of when you've got um, poor public knowledge around mental health conditions, specifically around schizophrenia. You can wind up in in these sorts of situations that they're they're frankly just not valid. Um, you know, I don't think anybody, including me as the as the psychologist, I don't think any of us would have picked up when this daughter is uh, what like 20, 20 and a half that she is is developing schizophrenia um i've been in this situation a few times now where i've missed it um and it's later once i see the full-blown psychosis that i go oh that's what that was about you weren't just disorganized you were experiencing i guess the beginnings of psychosis um but yeah it's uh i guess it, it, it it does lead to this rubbish situation but i think some of this is also generated by this this man being um, uh, an interesting human, given the way that he escalates with the judge, this is unusual behaviour. Um, I'm assuming that plays a very large part in it. All right, that's all for today. That was quite a fun one. Um, you know, uh, let's see how we go. And uh, I will, uh, I guess I'll be doing another one at some point. So take care, guys. I shall catch you around. See you.